All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Samaya Rubio, and I work for Store America's Estuaries as our Community Engagement Associate. Um, and I'm really excited to present to you Breaking Barriers and Disrupting the Norm, a conversation about oyster aquaculture, climate change, and environmental justice. So we've got two incredible speakers today. First up, we've got Leslie Townsell. She got her BS in biology from Spelman College, her MS in biology from Clark Atlanta, and she's currently at the University of Georgia. And another great thing about Leslie is that she's in leadership at Black and Marine Science, which is a nonprofit organization founded to uplift Black people in pursuing marine science. Our other speaker is Imani Black. Imani has worked in fisheries and has become passionate about minorities excelling in the field of aquaculture. And Imani is currently in her master's program at University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Imani also founded uh, Minorities in Aquaculture, and she's going to tell you all about it today. Thank you all so much for joining and take it away, you two. Awesome. Thank you so much. Wow. OK, so hi, everybody. Um, I, we're really excited to be here today. We have a really great conversation and presentation. Um, and yeah, we're just going to be talking about uh, basically how our research and our work connect. Um, so I guess we can go to the first slide. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, so like, so should we get started, Lizzie, or do we have the slides up? Yeah, you can go ahead and um, they're up. You can go ahead and introduce yourself really quickly. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so my name is Imani Black, uh, and my research is really into the Chesapeake Bay. So I've been involved in restoration and conservation of the Chesapeake Bay since I was younger. I'm from the Chesapeake Bay area. I'm originally from the eastern shore of Maryland. So a lot of my interests and um, a lot of my passions about the Bay have really transitioned into what I did in college, which was studying marine biology. Um, and then as a commercial oyster farmer for the last six years. Um, and so for me, aquaculture is really um, something that I've dove into, not just like in my uh, nonprofit minorities in aquaculture, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but just also different parts of aquaculture. Being on the commercial side, um, there's a lot of different lenses that I've started to see. And so I'll talk about that a little bit later too, but um, I'll pass it on to Leslie to introduce herself. All right. So my name is Leslie Townsell. I'm currently a graduate student at the University of Georgia. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more later on in the presentation about um, kind of how I got into the field, but my love for marine science essentially grew from childhood when my parents would take me to aquariums and maritime centers um, during our travels. Um, so I really have them to thank, and I know they're watching me right now, so thanks mom and dad. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. So today, um, we want you to take away a few things. We're going to be talking about ocean and coastal acidification, oyster aquaculture, um, the relationship between coastline loss, fisheries, and culture, as well as active minority engagement and how it's multi-layered, and then our organizations, uh, minorities in aquaculture and Black and marine science, as well as our journeys and our approach, our approach to active, impactful active minority engagement. So I will start out first. Um, usually when people think of climate change, they think of melting ice caps, polar bears losing their habitat, but I think of coral bleaching, increased sea surface temperature, sea level rise, beach erosion, ocean and coastal acidification, but there's so many more things going on because of climate change. Um, today, we're gonna be diving into ocean and coastal acidification. Um, so the ocean is absorbing about 25% of anthropogenic CO2, which is enhancing greenhouse warming and causing a decrease in pH, creating a more acidic environment for marine life. This process is called ocean acidification. 
So in the oceanic carbon cycle, um, this anthropogenic CO2 is drawn down into the ocean where it reacts with water forming carbonic acid, and then it dissociates into um, bicarb and hydrogen ions. Uh, this makes the ocean more acidic. At a lower pH, these extra hydrogen ions combine with carbonate ions forming another bicarb. Um, so ocean acidification essentially reduces carbonate ion concentration and makes it harder for um, precipitate calcium carbonate um, to precipitate calcium carbonate from calcium in carbonate ions. Um, and a lot of times these marine organisms uh, make their skeletons or shells from calcium carbonate. And this acidic pH can essentially cause these shells and skeletons to be harder to make or it causes them to actually dissolve. So closer to um, the shore, coastal waters are experiencing coastal acidification. So this is where freshwater and seawater mix and the carbonate alkalinity and the ocean's buffering capacity are actually reduced. So increasing organic matter contributes to increased bacterial growth and respiration, which is increasing um, CO2 further. And changes in the coastal water quality and coastal acidification are a threat to the rise of oyster aquaculture because larval development and their settling capabilities depend on water temperature and food availability. Um, and coastal ecosystems um, or hatchery intake systems, similar to the hatchery intake system that I work at at the UGA Hatchery, are highly susceptible to this coastal acidification, but I'll talk about that in just one second. So now we're going to talk a little bit about oyster aquaculture. Um, so our main study organism is going to be the Crassastria virginica. Um, so the Crass Astria virginica is the eastern oyster, um, and global aquaculture actually increased more than threefold between 1997 to 2017. This contributed to um, more than 50% of the world's seafood supply, and oysters were actually the leading group of this farm mollusk, and then oyster aquaculture um, is likely to continue to grow because of oysters rapid growth rates, their ability to live in these dense reef systems and their lack of need for a cultivated food source. So oysters are actually the second most valuable bivalve in the US. And like I said, the Crassastria virginica or the Eastern oyster, it ranges from the Atlantic coast down to the Gulf of Mexico. And it is the dominant mollusk used in aquaculture across the Western Atlantic. So like I said, oysters, these skeletons and shells are sensitive to temperature and pH. So although C. virginica has been studied for ocean acidification sensitivity in the past, there's not a lot of research regarding the effects of increased pH on the oyster larvae. So understanding the Georgia, the Georgia cultivar of the Crassastria virginica and its sensitivity to ocean acidification is important due to the resilience that these Georgia cultivars might actually have in their native waters. Um, so I just have um, a picture here of uh, the Castrastria gigas, uh, which is common in, um, it's actually now the Pacifica gigas, so it's common over in the West Coast, and you can see like the shell dissolving. Um, and then there's also the larval shell length of this um, that you can see. And this is from Waldebusser et al. in 2015. So the circles and squares um, are the first and second experiments. And the gray boxes are from the second run of those experiments that Waldebusser conducted. Um, and they signify medium and low um, high saturation states. So warmer waters are triggering oysters to spawn. And the spawning season for the Sea Virginica in the Chesapeake Bay actually ranges from July to October when the temperature is above 25 degrees and from April through September in Georgia. And these are indicated by the red boxes on these slides. Um, so both of these areas are actually warming, which could change the oyster spawning season and it could cause them to exceed their thermal tolerance. Um, despite the th this shorter spawning season, Chesapeake Bay has a way more successful oyster economy, which makes you wonder why. Um, Imani, you're from Maryland and you've been researching the Chesapeake Bay fisheries. Can you give us a little insight into the history of those fisheries? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think, you know, you bring up a really great point on how uh, coastal acidification is changing 
um, you know, the oysters and the oyster industry and how that affects that. Um, everyone knows that the Chesapeake Bay has a very unique and rich history of, of fisheries. And it's been a huge part of our um, economic value and economic system um, for many decades. Um, we have a long history in using fisheries as a viable resource from the Native Americans first using that as primarily in their diet all the way to enslaved Africans and then uh, leading into African Americans being prominent in the fisheries and then the fisheries taking off after the industrial uh, industrial era, um, getting into um, more um, technical uh, systems used on boats and it being a higher commodity as far as economic value. Um, so it's really tied up into a lot of the things that we do on the Chesapeake Bay and coastal acidification has definitely been something in that has been a huge conversation in the scientific and waterman community on how can we move forward from this and what can actually be done. Um, getting into now having anchor culture in the Chesapeake Bay, which was first, first introduced to be able to replenish and rebuild the oyster industry, but then also to satisfy that economic value of oysters. Um, we're seeing a huge surge in anchor culture in Maryland um, specifically. And so uh, right now, a lot of our concentration is focusing on how can aquaculture culture not only um, mimic the different systems of an oyster, but then also how can it really start to enhance the value of oysters and also bring it back into the local um, side of it too. But there's a lot of different things that we bring into the um, into the aquaculture culture space and especially the hatchery space. And so, yeah, so I think that when it comes to our waters changing, that definitely affects um, the impact and uh, success of our um, hatcheries since they're pulling that water in. So I think that kind of leads perfectly into like these hatchery systems and kind of what I'm focusing on for my research. Um, as you know, during spawning season, the males and females, they're spawning into the water and the larvae start to develop and they move through a series of free living larval stages over a 14 to 21 day period. Um, generally, the wild oyster community goes through several spawns uh, each summer, and the hatcheries actually depend on these seasonal cycles and the production of spat um, from the wild spawning stock, as well as the reared larvae. Uh, they also depend on water intakes from near nearby tidal creeks and estuaries. So in 2020, uh, the pH of the UGA hatchery ranged from 7.51 to 8.45. Um, and this was because of the high susceptibility to coastal acidification. Um, and currently, the hatchery is adding bicarb to their water to increase their pH. So this leads me to my research question, like, how, how much bicarb is too much bicarb? So the goal of my project was to evaluate the growth and survival of oyster, of the Georgia oyster larvae under these high pH conditions. I looked at them between um, day zero and day 14 of their life cycle before they started to settle. Um, and I had to determine, well, I was trying to determine how much is too much. Um, and I was hoping that my results are, will help guide like spat production, contribute to management and conservation of the wild stocks, as well as offer an enhanced economic opportunity for the resilience of the Georgia oysters. Um, and so essentially I hypothesized that the pH increase of, um, that as pH increase, C. virginica would actually increase larval growth and survival. So um, I'm gonna do a quick rundown of my methods and my experimental design. So of course we did oyster collection where we had to go out in the estuary and um, collect the oysters. Then we brought them back into the hatchery and we had to determine their sex. And we did this by looking under a microscope. Um, then we had to separate them and strip spawn and fertilize them um, by recombining the sperm and the eggs. And then I had to do my tank setup. So I had three 640 gallon tanks um, and each of them were filled with different pH levels. And then I had another 640 gallon tank, which was kind of my stocking tank that held all of my oysters before I separated them into my treatment tanks. Um, so I did the initial stocking of the tanks with my pH treatments. Um, the oysters were fed 
daily, twice a day actually, and then drain downs and water changes were conducted every other day, depending on the size of the tank. So my treatment tanks were actually five gallons. Um, so during those drain downs and water changes, I would do a, a oyster counts to determine if the oysters were kind of growing based on like this, a sieve size. And as the bottom left-hand picture, this is what an oyster uh, tank drain down looks like. So I just have a mesh sieve um, inside of a cut out Home Depot bucket and um, the oysters will drain down onto that sieve and everything that is collected will um, tell me like what rate they're growing at based on the sieve size. Um, and then I did a crucible Wallace test um, in order to determine like their growth and survival. So um, <laughs> they did not grow or survive at our expected rate <laughs> based on their life cycle stages, which I said were measured by their sieve size. Um, and this caused, so there was a decline in larval survival um, and it indicated that the life cycle, they actually played a larger role in the growth and survival than the pH treatment did. Um, so as you can see in the figure, um, after day eight, there was a decrease in larval abundances, and then there was kind of a die-off um, happening around day 13 and 14. Um, so growth was defined as the number of individual larvae that grew to the appropriate size based on traditional growth rates using their mesh sieves. Um, so the 53 micron and the 100 micron sieves were measuring growth. And then survival was defined as the number of larvae counted on all of the mesh sieves during drain downs and the 41 micron sieve measured survival. So essentially the 41 micron sieve sat below the 53 or the 100 micron depending on what day of the drain down it was. And it caught everything that was not caught on the two uh, other sieves. So growth and survival actually decreased with time. Um, and the data also determined that um, there was a variation within treatments and it was greater than the variation between treatments. So it signified a trend towards reduced growth and survival due to life cycle day. Um, so looking at the mortality, we define that as the number of larvae that died and it was not impacted by pH treatment or life cycle day. So this study actually suggested that maternal lipids could play a more important role in supporting the C. virginica growth and survival prior to day nine of the life cycle. And if you know anything about oysters, um, they are equipped with maternal lipids that kind of last, uh, kind of hold them over until day eight or day nine of their life cycle. Um, so they were getting fed and I know they were eating because we all know that oyster, like one oyster can filter about, this. an adult oyster can filter about 50 gallons of water a day, but these little guys were in five gallon tanks and they were, they were definitely filtering the water because when I came back after their feedings, the water was clear again. So I know that they were eating. I'm just not sure if maybe they didn't like the food we were giving them. So some next steps would potentially be changing the food source, maybe doing a live algae instead of an algae concentrate, um, or maybe like just figuring out kind of what they prefer. Um, so lessons learned include that, you know, pH might not be the only water quality variable um, that is of concern to growers. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about coastal acidification and the loss of fisheries and how it's leading to the decline of culture. Yeah, and so this really gets into um, what I was saying before, the connection between Leslie and I's uh, research. And so she talked a lot about, you know, the pH changing, temperature changing, and different things that were happening in an oyster hatchery um, that growers should be concerned about. And so, like I said, I'm from the Chesapeake Bay area. I've been a commercial oyster farmer um, for since uh, 2016 in the Chesapeake Bay area, working in hatcheries, nurseries, and farms um, before I went into school and before I started minorities in aquaculture. So working on the ground in aquaculture, I got to see a lot of different things. And then go going into academia in 2021, um, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted my research to be, um, there was a lot of different things that were happening of, you know, me understanding uh, the history of the Chesapeake Bay, of um, different demographics, um, understanding the ecological changes that were happening on the Chesapeake Bay and with the loss of fisheries. But then it's all kind of came together in this equation of like, well, does that mean that we're also losing our culture too? Because as everyone knows, 
on the Chesapeake Bay or any coastal community, there's a large culture that comes with the fishing industry and um, it's really tied to those coastal communities. So next slide, please. So specifically, um, I started really getting interested in the African-American experience on the Chesapeake Bay. And for those of you who don't know, um, the history of African-Americans in this watershed is just as rich as the history of the watershed itself. Um, you know, like I said before, Native Americans were the first uh, demographic to really have seafood a part of their diet. And then enslaved Africans came over and were really living by the water's edge. Everyone knows there's a story about Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, how they use their uh, knowledge of the waterways to escape slavery. Um, so they had a really great tie to not only the watershed itself, but the resources that they were able to get um, themselves and to be able to cultivate themselves. And so as you know, um, African Americans consistently lived by the water's edge, um, you know, working out of the water then became another notch of being a free slave or being able to work for themselves out on boats and get their own income with um, with no kind of middle person in between that. And so we see a lot of sailboat making. Um, you know, like I said, we had a lot of equipment that African Americans made, uh, nets. There's a tons of different things that we're still using in present day commercial fisheries that were actually originated from a design of African Americans. And so as I kind of got into that and then also learned that I actually have a tied to that industry. You know, I have watermen dating back in my family um, since, you know, the early 1800s. I really started to think about, you know, how does that tie into all of the things that I know from aquaculture and this um, kind of fluctuation of ecological changes. Uh, next slide, please. And so with that, um, I also, you know, started to look at, you know, the women of color that were a part of this space because I was trying to understand um, the entirety of the experience. There's not a lot of data and documentation that's about women of color in these spaces. And so that really gets into um, kind of my reasoning behind getting into minorities in aquaculture, which I'll get into a little bit later. Next slide, please. So one of the things that really, um, you know, kind of pushed me to want to uh, focus my research on the African American experience on the Chesapeake Bay um, was because I started to do, like I said, a lot of, um, you know, Black history research of the Chesapeake Bay. And in that research and just over time of different articles and different things that have been coming out um, over the last couple of years about African Americans in the Chesapeake Bay as watermen, um, you know, I recently have, you know, found out that there is only nine, potentially 10 active black boat captains that are commercially still working on the Chesapeake Bay. And so when I really kind of pinpointed that number and then also talked to those those last living black watermen you know they're all over the age of 60 oldest is 80 is 84 and there's no younger generation coming behind them and so I really started to think about well how did we get here how did we get to this such low number from being you know one of the most prominent demographics in in the early starts of the fishery, um, what were sort of the pinpoint effects of that? And a lot of the articles and things that people have been talking about in this experience is kind of the racial oppressions that have happened for African Americans. And as we know that that's very true, I wanted to kind of dig a little bit deeper below the surface to see what I could really find. Next slide, please. And so with a combination of all the things that I've done on the Chesapeake Bay that I've learned, that I've worked on, that I you know, enjoy recreationally, and really thinking about the history of the, you know, my forebears that came um, and worked on the Chesapeake Bay and really kind of built the Chesapeake Bay fisheries that we know now, um, I started really asking myself the question of like, does the past shape the future? And would my experience on the Chesapeake Bay, my relationship with these waterways have changed if I had never had the introductions that I did at an early age. Um, so that really drove me into looking at like a 50 year overview of the historical involvement and experience of African-Americans in the Chesapeake Bay to really figure out what were those domino effects leading into that, you know, nine active black captains into the future, into where we are now and why we, we are, were there. 
Next slide, please. So um, one of the things that also kind of, you know, pushed me to doing this research um, is that when you look at the academic side of this, uh, this conversation, there aren't many uh, scientific articles or journals that um, have really been looking at what's going on, not just in the Chesapeake Bay, but other coastal communities. As you can, as you can see, you know, there's papers about African Americans in Georgia on um, coastal fisheries, which this ties back to your um, research, Leslie, a little bit of what's going on in different parts of um, the East Coast and how do, are they connected. When we really look at these these papers and this background, a lot of these areas, especially Georgia and, and the Chesapeake Bay are very similar when it comes to their ecological changes, but then also this community um, value change as well. Um, so that was another really key aspect for me really pushing to want to um, look into this. Next slide, please. So some of the things that I am looking into specifically, like I said, is really, um, looking at the that existing records you know the archives of what we actually do know about black history um you know i i want to have a starting point of where we're missing some of the um the aspects of this conversation because i really think that there's there's something more than racial oppression and so um i have recently you know i've finished my interviews for uh, my research right now. And so I talked to all of the, um, basically all of the black captains um, that are working on the Chesapeake Bay and that were current on the Chesapeake Bay or were in the communities that are, were really prominent um, in the Chesapeake Bay commercial fisheries. Um, I've talked to historians and different people like that just to get a range of what was the experience like? What were um, the experiences like from the mouths of these nine black watermen? Um, was it racial oppression? Was it economic um, change? Was it social change? Was it cultural change? Um, and after talking to them, I've really have looked at, you know, there's a lack of like approaches when it comes to social science and hard science. Um, the, the notion that traditional ecological knowledge, the knowledge that these African-American watermen know that won't get passed down if we don't add on to this legacy um, is not really considered hard science. It's not really considered at high regard as information that we need to know. And this goes along into the waterman community in general. Um, and working in the on the commercial side of aquaculture, I've learned firsthand that watermen have a abundance of information. They're out there every day. You learn so much about your environment. And so I'm really interested in, is there, the, is there impact in the ecological knowledge that they know and how can we really bring that into the future? Um, and also using the ecological historical landing data as well to cooperate with what they're saying. So if there's a waterman that says, I started to see a fluctuation in my catch in 1969, then I can go back to the historical landings, see what was going on ecologically, match that up, but then also look at how that what was going on socially at that time. So everyone, you know, I guess like really looks at, you know, minority experience as, you know, one layered, but really in, you know, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, that I really think that it's multi-layered. It's not just, you know, what we haven't been exposed to, but it's what's, what does our community think of this occupation culturally? What have we been thinking about this socially? What is our ties to it? So um, I'm really looking at what were the domino effects of this history um, from the mouths of the African-American watermen, and then really giving um, some suggestions on how we can move forward in active minority engagement in more impactful ways in the Chesapeake Bay. Next slide, please. So quickly, a little bit about my methodology. Like I said, um, I'm those interviews and those oral histories are a big part of the data that I'm collecting. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to get a, you know, collective range of oral histories, again, to get the overall story. So like I said, living black captains and watermen that are still around in the Chesapeake Bay, community members of 
coastal communities that once had, you know, were very prominent in the perception of Chesapeake Bay commercial fisheries. For example, Bellevue, Maryland um, was, ho was housed to the largest African-American seafood packing house um, by the Turner family um, for many, many years. And now it is being is being um, susceptible to and impacted by gentrification um, because of a multitude of different reasons. So kind of looking into all of the different things that have been happening on um, the on the on these coastal communities and really bringing those questions to uh, this group of people and asking them point blank what their opinions are and what their hopes for the future are. Um, like I said, using ecological data with historical landings of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, looking at what we already know about the ecological impacts and how they could be affecting, you know, the African Americans and their experience in these coastal communities. And then, of course, existing literature to really um, unpack the approaches from here. Yeah, next slide. Okay, so um, I think this really gets us to a place where um, Leslie and I can really open up the conversation and really talk about, like, the different things that got us to where we're where we are now, um, because I know, and as you can see in my in my research, there's a multitude of different ties to not only my personal career and relationship with the Chesapeake Bay, but then also just my experience of being in commercial aquaculture, being a um, African American woman in marine sciences. I can see a lot of the similarities in my research um, with the experiences of the African Americans. And so for me, um, I think that, you know, it wasn't just the different things that I went through, but it was not really seeing myself in a space that like I really loved. And so Leslie, we've talked a little bit about that of like how we really got started um, in doing what we're doing now and our connection um, and alignment on everything kind of maybe at different times, but it seems like we've gone through a lot of similar things being African-American women in marine sciences, don't you think? I definitely agree with you on that one. Um, so I, like I said earlier, I kind of started in marine science or got passionate about the field as a child, but I never saw anybody that looked like me in the field. So it was just like, I didn't know it was like a real career. So I resorted to going to a Spelman studying bio. And I was just like, well, I'm going to be pre-med. I'm going to be a doctor because, you know, that's just how things went. And then when I found out like this was a legitimate career and like I could actually do it and make a living and not, you know, not have to live with my parents for the rest of my life. I was just like, okay, well, we're going to try this out and you know what, we're going to be successful. So I, I went to UGA and I started in the fall of 2018. Um, and I, I still, there was still no, nobody that looked like me in my department um, until this day. So now there's actually three of us in our department, which is amazing. Um, and one of them graduated with their master's this past um, fall. So congrats, Tia. But um, it's just, it's been incredible to see like the change in front of your eyes. And I know you were talking kind of about how, you know, with the watermen, like they can essentially say, oh, back in 1969, I saw this change. So they're seeing the change in person. And as scientists, we're kind of extrapolating when that change will happen, kind of mm -hmm. like on paper. Um, so being able to see the change like right in front of your eyes is really just, I, I don't know how to explain it, to be honest. Your, your perspective about everything, I think. And, you know, it really just opens your eyes to so much more than you even thought it was. I think even like being um, the, you know, African-American women in these spaces and now targeting and really helping the next generation, it's. I, I'm learning so many different things that like I didn't even know. I think only because like I was really used to being in that like token, like, you know, black person role. And I wasn't, I was like, oh my God, like it really didn't take, it took me a while to like really realize like that I had just been accustomed to being in that space. And so it didn't bother me until it bothered me, um, <laughs> if that makes sense. And so, yes, and I think you brought up a really great point too um, that I've really been looking at in this like, multi-layered active minority engagement approach is like, you know, at HBCUs, you know, there's there's a there's a layer of perception of like black people or people of color like aren't interested in marine science. Like they're not aren't interested in this. So how do you get them into this? Like 
when you go to HBCUs and they have biology departments, they have that same mindset that you do of like, well, I'm just going to go to, to pre-med. This is just a step. But I'm like, well, what if we get to them right before they make that final decision? And we say, with the same classes, you could also take X, Y, and Z. It's not that they're not interested. Maybe they just don't know that that's what you can do. I think we've had so much happen and so many narratives get put on Black people. Like, Black people don't know how to swim. Black women don't like to get their hair wet. And I think this also plays into that, well, Black people don't do marine science because they don't know how to swim. They don't want to get their hair wet. But that's not true. Like, no. that's not true at all. So it's just like trying to break those generational stereotypes is also kind of part of what we're going through. Like, getting rid of those generational stereotypes and letting mm -hmm. people know Black people do swim. Black people are good and great at swimming. And Black people can do marine science. Black men, women will get their hair wet. So, yeah. and honestly, you can be a marine scientist and never get in the water at all. So you don't have to get your hair wet. There are marine scientists who work on boats strictly. There are marine scientists who collect their data scuba diving. There are marine scientists who work in a lab and take like, get people do the field work and they take the the uh, date the samples and they run all of the data analysis for them so you don't have to get wet to be a marine scientist right and i think that's like also in aquaculture too or one of the things i like try to you know do um in minorities in aquaculture just like even my like public speaking of like I know everyone's not as crazy as me to be an oyster farmer. Like it takes like a, it takes a special person to want to be out there in the cold. And trust me, I don't even like the cold, but like, I love aquaculture enough that like, I'm like, this is what we got to do. And I'm just going to like put on a, put on a face and just do it. We just like do the work, but not everybody wants to do that. And so I really try to just say that like, there's so many different disciplines that can go into this space it's it's really not about diversity equity and inclusion it's just about like one we as people of color were already in this space so we have a connection so aquaculture to me is just like a new wave of commercial fishery so i'm like okay well we might as well just bring everybody over to this new conversation especially if everyone's going to benefit and be impacted by it like might as well okay and you know and then with that history piece we then also start cultivating stewards of like oh wow like my ancestors did this or people in my community did this or whatever you know we start to like make those relationships so then we can start disrupting those norms you know and i think like we've gotten like a little bit of um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say like heat, but just like the con we've opened up a conversation in both of our fields <laughs> where we are really disrupting this norm and not really meaning to, but meaning to of just like, um, and so, yeah, like talk to me a little bit about that. Cause I already know a little bit about the story. Cause you know, we've been connected for since the beginning, but what was your guys's like approach to BIMS when it came to disrupting the norm and like kind of your engagement with minorities in what you guys wanted to do? Like, what was that decision kind of that final step of like, let's just do it ourselves type of thing. So that is a fantastic question. I'm actually going to pause really quickly and see if we have any questions from the audience um so yeah if anybody has any questions please just let us know we're going to take a quick pause um and then imani i will answer that question of like what was the straw that broke the camel's back essentially yeah. We're absolutely. Gonna let's, let's do it. yeah absolutely yeah if anyone has any questions definitely um leslie let's go to the next slide because that's our question side disrupting the norms uh before we get into our organizations but yeah if anybody has any questions about what we've talked about so far or as we're getting into this uh conversation we would love to know okay so um oh wait we got a question we will answer these in real time um oh <laughs> please please keep disrupting always always <laughs> um thank you for that <laughs> yeah, seriously uh, yeah so, okay, what was the straw that broke the camel's back? Honestly, it was 2020. We were all sick of COVID, not sick with COVID, but sick of COVID. Um, everything had moved to virtual. Um, and we just, we just, oh my gosh, the isolation that COVID caused was 
depressing. Yeah. It, it was hard, like living on your own, um, making sure that you were trying to stay six feet away from everybody. Grocery shopping was stressful. Really doing anything during COVID was stressful. So I think the straw that broke the camel's back was us needing community. Um, mm -hmm. And then seeing, the, seeing what was going on in the world and not being okay with it. Like, why can't Black people just be in nature and not have somebody come chasing after them or getting the police called on them? Like, why does that always have to be the outcome? Right. So like that, that really was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, so I know there's another question, but really quickly, I want to ask Imani, like, what, what about you? What was yeah. the straw that broke the camel's back? Right? Question too. And thank you so much, Vita, for asking, um, the question of how do we handle emotional burnout? Um, because, you know, I felt the exact same way, kind of being really exhausted, being the only one before I even started the journey of minorities in agriculture. Um, but I think for, you know, agriculture for me, it was like, a, it was different of like, I had more of like an experience of like being just a woman in those spaces than being like, and like a person of color, like it, it was like, I was, you know, my first oyster job, I was the only woman out of 25 guys. And I was like, you know, after playing, you know, division one lacrosse for four years and being on a team with 35 girls, I was like, this is a different, different beast, <laughs> definitely a different beast. So it took me, you know, um, some time to like really get used to that. But I think like, what really got me into that step of like, how to like, you know, starting my nurse in agriculture, like I had no idea that I was even going to do that. And it was really like this moment of like, like you said, in 2020, like really seeing like the conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion and marine, in, in marine sciences, but then also like the agriculture industry, I like really dedicated at that point, six years of my career and wanted to dedicate more and didn't really see a lot of advocacy that was happening in that space as far as people of color. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, and that really just like pushed me to ask myself, like, do I, did I ever feel really safe in any of those spaces? Um, and the answer was honestly like really no. And so then it was like, okay, well, maybe I need to like, take a step and try to find like other women of color to have that network, to have that community um, so that there is an emotional burnout, you know, like I think the way that we handle emotional burnout is by community is knowing that we have others in our space that, um, that know what we feel like, you know, I just wanted to have a conversation where I didn't have to explain so many things where it was just like, and I think our first conversation actually was like that where we were, I think we talked for like over an hour and we were just instantly connected about the things that we went through. I don't even think we had to like finish that whole sentence. We were just like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Parallel lives in different regions of the country. Exactly. exactly. And so that right there just solidified our, fr our friendship from there. And we didn't really even have to like, you know, it was just like a comfort comfortability. It was just like a safeness. And so I think that's really how I've been, you know, handling emotional burnout lately. And I think another thing with emotional burnout is like to handle it, you really need to have a support system. So I, I really think it's imperative to put your support system in place before you go down these, these paths that you know are going to be long and lonely. Um, because without that support system, you don't have anybody to essentially fall back on. So your support system can be your parents, it can be your friends, it can be your therapist. I highly recommend going to therapy. Um, yeah, that's all I can say about that. Um, but I know we, we have, um, yeah. yeah. I think we have, so we have another question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so absolutely great discussion and research. Thank you so much. We are happy that you're here. How do you start and continue community engagement while we are continuing to readjust Post pandemic, how do you how do you all communicate the diverse opportunities to minorities who aren't sure of the options in the field? Okay, do you want me to take it or do you want to take um, a? We can split it. Do you want to you? Mm, we can we can split. It. <laughs> I can go first. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think you know when we the way that minorities in agriculture are really that like 
you know, we think about um, communicating with um, our, you know, targeted demographics, which right now is women of color, but really, you know, we're, we recognize minorities as all of the underrepresented demographics within our culture. Of course, people of color are like a, a top priority, but like I said, we don't really stand only on the the pillar of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we really stand on communicating to our community as a whole. Um, so for us, it's really about like meeting people where they are when it comes to their environmental education. Um, you know, we understand adjusting post pandemic, but there's a lot of people who are like really itching that we saw in 2020 that were really like getting outside more and like fishing more and like doing all these things more. And so, that really has been something that we have been um, just building on is like people's interest in um, wanting to learn about the environment and wanting to learn about their, you know, sustainable choices and different things like that and really bringing them that education so that they can decide for themselves about aquaculture and sustainable seafood. Um, ways that we, you know, personally for the, our organization that we communicate um, different opportunities is through our um, job board and through our um, monthly newsletters. And so we actively have, you know, a running, you know, submission that we have on our um, job on our website where people can submit opportunities. There's obviously requirements. And Leslie, this kind of gets into like what BIMS does as well. Like there's requirements that we um, mandate and, you know, on our website of like salary needs to be posted, like all of these different things like need to be um, included because we want them to be really good opportunities, not just opportunities that frankly, like I had to go through of, you know, $10 an hour at an oyster farm, like nobody needs to live like that. And I won't let people live like that pretty much. I'm going to answer the second part of the question and then the first part of the question. So communicating those opportunities, just like MIA, we BIMS has an opportunities board, but you have to put your money where your mouth is. Not only do you have to have the, the salary range up there to make sure it is worth someone's time so that not, they're not taking a step down in salary, um, you also have to be one of, we have to have a partnership or some sort of collaboration with you. So you can start out as an ally member and that's $300 a year. And it actually supports a BIMS membership for a BIMS member who couldn't otherwise afford their membership. Um, but that allows you to kind of speak with BIMS members directly. It allows you to post um, opportunities, whether they be internships or jobs or anything like that to our board, to our opportunities board. Um, and then there's other like, like there's other levels to these sponsorships. So you can be an organizational sponsor and support five BIMS members, um, as well as have like access to like our behind the scenes, not access to our safe spaces because we don't do that. But you know, you can still talk to us directly instead of having to go through other people. Um, yeah. To answer that first part of the question, starting like continuing community engagement, um, how we're adjusting post pandemic, we are doing a lot more stuff in person. Um, so I will say this BIMS week this year is in person. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but we are showing up wherever you all are at and we are doing stuff in person and making sure that you see us out here. Um, so yeah, I know we have a couple more questions. Um, so we have one here. Imani, did you have anything else that you wanted to add to that? No, I think that was, I think that was good. Yeah. So thank you both for sharing your research. Imani, I appreciated your discussion of history and how it shapes the future. I'm amazed at the estimates of oyster counts in Native American shell mounds, some in the billions and recent research highlights their mariculture technologies and infrastructure like clam gardens and fish ponds. Would you agree that this is that the displacement of indigenous people who manage these estuaries is often and often overshadowed by other reasons, mining over harvesting pollution, for the loss of oysters in the 19th and 20th centuries. Are you familiar okay. with any tribal nations that are reclaiming space in the aquaculture industry or estuary management? Yes, yes, I love all of that. And I was shaking my head the entire time that you read. I don't know if you saw my face, I was like, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think that, you know, that was one of the things that really drove me into like what I'm looking into now because I saw that it was just like we were scratching the surface. I'm like, there had to be, more than just like that humans are the villains in this conversation. I'm not saying that we haven't 
done pollution, over harvesting, all of those different things. But like, I feel like sometimes in the conversation of the, the decline of fisheries, we forget about the cultural side of it. And especially Native Americans, like we really have not even touched the gold mine of their history. I mean, especially like with African Americans, I feel like there's a, a huge comparison there of like, um, you know, they had a relationship with the waterways that Native Americans and indigenous people have for way longer than anybody else. They have their cultural practice. That traditional ecological knowledge is gold and we will not bring that into science. And I think that that really hinders us from understanding how our past has shaped our future. What have we done in the past that's worked and what hasn't? I'm not saying that things have don't change over time, but there is there is knowledge in that past, I think. And so, yeah, I'm, you know, I have actually, um, uh, you know, a master student who is one of my, you know, good friends uh, at University of Maryland, who's actually looking at um, the indigenous experience. So similar to like my research, she's looking at the indigenous um, experience um, in like Chesapeake Bay restoration um, practices and different things like that. So I'm really excited for that research um, to come out. And so, yeah, I just think that we just need to like really open up that conversation that just gets into like that I think that active minority engagement is multi-layered. And I think history is a huge part of that. Thank you for that question. <laughs> that was really good. Leslie, do you want to get in, wrap up and get into uh, just like do our round out of our organizations? And then if we have like one or two questions at the very end before we close, then we can do that. I think that sounds great because we have one question that we might actually be answering in the next couple seconds with that. So okay. Here we go. Okay, so to round all of this out, um, all of the things that I just talked about with the history, my experience with the Chesapeake Bay has all led to the development of minorities in aquaculture. Um, so like Leslie and I talked about, we both um, started our journey in our nonprofits in 2020. Um, minorities in aquaculture was an official 501c3 July of 2020. Uh, again, that experience was just me as a Google scholar looking at looking up how do I start a nonprofit and, <laughs> and then really just kind of doing a checklist from there. Um, so I had no idea what I was doing, but I knew that I wanted to connect with other women of color that were in my space. Like I said, really create that community. But over the last two and a half years, we've just done so much and we've become so much more um, than just a network, but we've come, we'll, we've really become a resource hub, not only for the underrepresented demographics in aquaculture, but just the aquaculture industry in general. Next slide, please. Um, so we've accomplished a lot in two and a half years that I can't even sometimes I still have to pinch myself about um, because all of this again was just an idea. But last year, you know, I was so excited. We launched really two, really two cool programs. One, our, um, our internship program where we fully funded five African-American women who are part of our members. We have over 120 members across the world right now. And um, we were able to fully fund internships for five of those members um, all up and down the East Coast in different oyster aquaculture um, facilities, institutions, and farms. And then we also launched kind of that cultural piece that I was talking about that um, in our um, minority engagement approach called Minorities on Course, working with those last living Black captains um, to add into and preserve that legacy by giving African Americans in their coastal communities access to getting their captain's license and enhancing and empowering their um, marine occupation on their waterways. Um, so using that education of aquaculture as a potential um, a career choice and also just creating that relationship and those avenues for African Americans to have the relationship with not just the Chesapeake Bay, but uh, coastal waters all across the world. So, yeah, that's uh, me. If anybody is interested in learning more about MIA, check out our website. We're on social medias and feel free to send me an email if you want to connect or partner. So, thank you. All right, so how did Black and Marine science start? Well, it was essentially after the harassment of the Black birder Christian Cooper, um, the need for Black and Marine science and, you know, just Black people being in nature was evident. So it essentially started from a tweet right here. Um, you guys can read it for yourself. 
Uh, and then we started, like we started with just BIMS week. Um, and that was our first one. We had hoped to have a successful week and we were honestly just blown out of the water by how successful and well received we were um, and how we had created a community of these black marine scientists uh, that was needed because of the isolation that COVID was causing. Um, so shortly after BIMS week ended, we got on the phone with each other and we we're like, you know what, let's make this a nonprofit. It's, we need it. So, you know, our mission is to um, celebrate Black marine scientists, spread environmental awareness, and inspire the next generation of thought leaders. And we are continuing to do that in our effort to highlight and amplify Black voices. We created um, BIMS TV, which consists of three regular series and a special, occasional special events. So we've got BIMS Bites, which is um, a weekly series that comes out Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, on this, you can catch Black marine scientists communicating their science or what they're passionate about um, in like a little digestible eight minute bite of science, eight to 10 minute bite of science. Then we have BIMS Bites Kids with our host, Andrew Walker. Um, and it's more for, you know, the kid level. He really gets on their level and talks to them in ways that they would understand. And then we have BIM Size, which is an hour long live stream. I'm sorry, BIM Spites Kids is monthly um, Saturdays at 11. And then we have BIM Dive, which is also monthly. And it's the last Friday at 6 p.m. Um, and it's a live stream. So you can pop in, you can ask questions just like you're doing right now. Um, but BIM Dives is like a monthly talk with a um, two moderators and an expert. And we usually pick a topic that's like, really on par for the month, usually on theme for whatever is happening in marine science um, that is big. So BIMS is going to continue to uphold our mission. And in doing so, we've created outreach opportunities, internships. We are currently working on a documentary among other things. Um, and we're gonna continue to strive to increase diversity by adding to our growing network of black marine scientists, which consists of over 300 black marine scientists spanning over 30 countries. Um, and last year, we raised $954,000. Um, so this year we hope to exceed that. So you can follow us on any one of our socials. You can email us. Um, make sure you follow, like, and subscribe to our YouTube. Um, and if you're interested in joining or supporting, like I said, email us, follow us, and don't forget to donate. Yes, absolutely. Thank you everybody for all of the questions. If we didn't get to it, um, definitely send us an email and follow up. Um, but uh, I know some people asked about the MIA shirts. Definitely keep track of our social media and our website because we're doing a spring merch launch. Um, so at the end of spring, uh, early summer, we should have some merch out for people to purchase. But um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming and spending your lunch hour with us. And we're really excited um, that we were able to share our experiences and our research with you. I think we have um, just a few more comments. So we had someone say BIMS TV, watch and share accessible oh. programming. So we do um, we do use ASL over on all of our videos to create accessible programming for the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, let's see, there was one last question. How do y'all reach the minorities or black audiences with marine and coastal issues? As you have mentioned, there's not a lot of us in STEM disciplines, especially in marine science, and maybe it is because of that, there isn't much involvement from predominantly Black communities. So your question does make sense. Um, so the way we reach them is just by, you know, trying to reach out to them through show, through socials. Um, I know I occasionally get emails saying like, hey, I heard about you through such and such, and I would like to join your mailing list. And once you're on your, our mailing list, you're, you're there forever, unless you email me and say like, I hate this, take me off, but I'm gonna email you. I'm gonna send you targeted at, like targeted opportunities that I think, you know, would align with your, your interest and stuff. So that is how, um, that is how you can join us. If you would like to join our mailing list, um, it is on our website. You can go to www.bims.org and you can click on um, the mailing list and you can go ahead and join. It's a little link. It'll take you to a form where you can put in your first, last name and email address. Um, and let's see. So could you put the links in the chat so they can be shared? Samaya, so would you mind doing that? Or can we yeah, put my email in okay. there? And my and the Perfect. website. So just do. 
Yes, I hope we answered all everyone's questions. I think going through, we did. Perfect. Awesome. And then I just have two short little announcements at the end. Um, first off, Restore, thank you so much to both of you for your participation in these. That It was fantastic, probably like one of the best webinars I've ever seen. So thank you all for that. Um, I know that I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else got a lot out of it. Um, from Restore America's Estuaries, we have a, a community of practice groups starting to kind of discuss what DEIJ looks like in our field and also create a space where you can share like struggles and frustrations um, with other people who are in the same um, in the same field and in the same kind of like job description. Um, and then another thing is that one of our partner organizations, uh, SURF, which is the Coastal and Estuarian Research Federation, has their Rising Tides program that's starting, and that's aimed at young people mostly. Um, so it's people who are either in college or just out of college and are looking for a job. So if you all are interested in that, you can reach out to SURF, um, which again is the Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation. And they do a lot of great stuff with, uh, with pulling in um, different resources and things for people who are trying to get involved in the field. That's the announcements from my side. Awesome. So, thank you all so much for your participation and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.